Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we are changing the mental health narrative, bringing hope and solutions. Here's your host, Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. Morgan Beard has dedicated her life to using creativity to heal and empower. Managing depression and anxiety since age 13 made her personal development something that was non-negotiable. After getting her master's in art therapy, her life came to a screeching halt as she burned out doing what she thought was her life purpose, and yet entered another depressive episode. Focused for the first time ever on her own happiness, Morgan started over in Los Angeles, California and began building her life coaching business. She was focused on helping others to restore belief in themselves, rewrite old programs that were keeping them stuck, and build lives full of fun and meaning. This gave her the confidence to embrace her passion for singing and to make music to help people move. She is currently working on her debut pop EP to be released in 2022. She can be reached via her website, morganbeard.coach, M-O-R-G-A-N-B-E-A-R-D dot C-O-A-C-H. Morgan, thank you so much for being here. And it's my uh, pleasure. I'm, I'm grateful that you agreed to do the interview. And I wonder if you could start us off by talking about how you got into the work you do and what drives your passion for it. Absolutely. So the reason that I'm in the wellness space, the sort of mental health, emotional health space is because it's something that I've always just absolutely needed access to myself. Um, it, I, I've been struggling with um, major depression and anxiety since I was about 13. I grew up in a really like high pressure, intense prep school academic environment. And I was also an only child and I was very scrutinized by my parents. Everything I did felt like I was under a microscope. Um, but at the same time, I wasn't really being seen. And I think that's a pretty common story, um, especially for people who grew up with parents that weren't seen themselves. And so I always felt like the world was at my feet, yet no one gave a shit about me. <laughs> I didn't ask you if I could curse. <laughs> Yikes. I'll try to keep it to a minimum. <laughs> OK. Um, but anyway, so I developed this very low is an understatement opinion of myself. I was totally self-hating as a teenager. I would look in the mirror and think there's no one that could be uglier or more of a waste of space than me. Um, and I just, I, you know, I didn't know what that was at that age. I didn't know it was dysmorphic. I didn't know it was major depression and I was kind of blocked from getting mental health support. Um, so it was something that I really deeply craved. I deeply craved intimacy, love, connection, deeper conversation, because my parents just weren't that emotionally mature, didn't kind of understand their own emotions and um, didn't get the support they needed when they were, uh, you know, growing up. And so I always felt really tremendously out of place until um, I went to college. I got away from sort of that under a microscope environment. Um, and towards the end of my college career, I finally um, was able to get counseling. And actually, that was the first time I was put on an antidepressant, um, which uh, we can go into that a little bit later. But that was definitely a tough, a tough transition for me. But it helped me kind of keep going and get to the next step and at least not be bogged down with thoughts of wanting to die all the time, thoughts of, um, you know, just total worthlessness. So um, I went out and I tried to do uh, the career that my parents thought I should do, which was one an independent film. Um, and I moved to New York, New York City for that job. And it was good. But I always felt like I'm like living in someone else's dream job. I'm not doing what is really true to me. Um, so I still felt there was that deep disconnect that I've been kind of trying to get away from my entire life. Um, and then through being in therapy and continuing that journey and having that safe space of being with someone who was understanding me and listening to me and seeing me, 
I really got the sense that I might like to do that myself and provide that for other people. And it it came to me kind of naturally because a lot of my friends and people in my network came to me for advice um, and support and a a safe space because I kind of understood that need to be heard and felt and seen. Um, So after three years in that job, I went back and got my master's in art therapy because I felt like, okay, I've always been creative and I wanted to combine my creativity with my desire to help people. And that dual purpose has continued to guide me and help me kind of reshuffle the cards and reshuffle the cards to get me to where I am now. So uh, after that master's, I started working at my first job after grad school. I was like, all right, I'm going to be financially independent and I found my purpose and I'm done. (laughs) But I wasn't (laughs) in five months of working at a large nursing home and still living in New York City. I completely burnt out and I hit my worst what I've come to term rock bottom or depressive episode that I had had thus far in my life. And my suicidal ideation came flying back in with a vengeance and every bone in my body just hurt. Like it was like, I was just like leaking pain all the time. I was calling my mom crying twice a day. Like, what do I do? This is awful. I couldn't bear it. And you know, you heard the beginning of my story. I'm not close to my parents. (laughs) It was bad. (laughs) Um, And so, uh, you know, I was, I had been trained in psychology. I knew what was going on. I knew about suicidal assessments and I was in the phase of planning. And so that's not good. That's not where you want to be. Um, so I quit that job and I had never quit anything before. I was like, I'm a super type a, like I can do anything like perfectionistic, super perfectionistic. And just, again, it made me feel that incredible sense of, heavy, uh, self hatred and guilt and shame for like, why can't I hack this? I'm supposed to be able to do this, but really looking back, I know that that wasn't at all where I was meant to be. Uh, so the universe was kind of like, no, 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 no. Don't go further down this path. This is not right for you. But at the time, you know, I didn't know that. So I left that job. I tried to go back. I tried to stay in New York for a little while to see if I could make it work. I went back to a position that I really liked on a volunteer basis, working at a psych unit that I had been at a grad school and still nothing. I just, I felt nothing. Everything just felt like garbage. Um, And so for the first time in my life, I really just said, okay, I'm at my wits end here. I need to do something just purely to try to make me happy, to try to figure out, can I be a happy soul on this planet? Cause I really, for most of my life felt like the answer to that question was no. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw other people doing it and was like, why can't I do this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, this one thing that kept evading me, like living with some sort of internal sense of peace and contentment. Cause I had all the kind of academic achievement. I have all of the economic privilege and opportunity. Why does my inside not match my outside? Um, so I took a big risk on myself that I'm really fortunate to have been able to do with the support of my parents. And I moved to Los Angeles and that was the first decision I'd ever made that wasn't purely focused on, How am I going to uh, help other people? This was just, how can I get to the sunshine and try to live a life where work and play is more balanced um, and be around people I felt like I would vibe with? And it was like, I packed up my car and I remember it was parked on 33rd and 3rd in Manhattan where I lived in that last apartment. And all my stuff was in my car and my parents said bye And I hit the gas on my cross country road trip. And it was like 50% of that depression just melted. And I felt free again. I felt like unburdened by the, the sort of prison I had trapped myself in really like mentally and externally. 
and the road trip was great. I got myself out here and I, you know, I found jobs and the one of one job I kind of stumbled into was working as a, an assistant for a woman who was a business coach for creative female entrepreneurs. And I watched what she did and I saw her interact with her clients. And that was really the first like positive and meaningful exposure I had had to the coaching industry, because as a therapist, I kind of looked down on that type of intervention because I was like, well, you know, I was all high and mighty in my fancy academic world thinking like, well, they don't even have a degree. (laughs) Um, Just, you know, ego nonsense. But she really helped me to see the connection between my financial wellness and my sense of self-worth and money being this currency or this energy um, and your mindset towards it is a huge piece of the puzzle because really all these things in our world externally represent and are connected to all these things in our world internally. And so there's that direct connection between how we feel about our sense of security and uh, self-worth that's reflected in how we, uh, you know, pursue jobs, how we pursue money in the world, how we think about that. Um, And I, you know, I was sort of (laughs) woo-woo-ized, you could say, um, living in Los Angeles, but the trade-off was I was happy now. (laughs) Um, And that felt like a pretty worthwhile trade-off, like to be, to go from someone who was from the East coast and sort of hovering above everything with this super judgmental lens and thinking in a way that happiness was untouchable for me to. Well, you know, pretty much it is. If you hold on to that super judgmental lens, happiness Mm -hmm. is out of reach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you never measure up because you just keep listening and buying into the same narrative over and over and you're not waking up to like what's really there, what's really around you, Um, which is not to say that it's easy. That's a pretty over, (laughs) oversimplified look. Um, Cause when you're in that depressed state, it, it feels absolutely impenetrable. Um, You know, it's like being in a torrential downpour and someone going, Oh, just turn off the rain. You're like, what? (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah, show me the valve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you give me the knob? Give me the, give me the faucet. Um, but yeah, it's for, so for me. Um, so then I, you know, then I, then I started so, my own coaching so, business. And, okay. So, so you got healthier, happier, mm-hmm, lighter, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you opened yourself to the possibility of coaching. Yeah. Where did that take you? What were, what were you using? How did you blend the things that you love with, coaching people? Yeah. So um, it was a pretty easy and natural transition because I had this incredible parallel training um, with my master's in art therapy. I had this sort of uh, the, the degree that I got was called a master of professional studies in art therapy. And the leaning of the school that I went to was very much client centric, meet your client where they are, deal with what's there. Um, and just be with them. And I, I also did, a, um, I trained to be a volunteer with the Suicide Prevention Center out here. And that was also a fabulous, fabulous training on just active listening, empathy at its most basic level, just being with the person, building a rapport, and then kind of transitioning them from a place of, I see you in your darkness and you feel felt. Now let's move up that ladder together versus telling them they're supposed to be a way other than suicidal, which I intuitively understood because I've been that person. You know, I remember one time in uh, the time where I was in New York and I would for nights and nights and nights, I would go up to the roof of my apartment building and just look over the edge and think about the reasons that I shouldn't jump Um, or really yeah, yeah. Just review all the reasons I shouldn't jump. And one night I called the suicide prevention line myself I actually had a pretty bad experience. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think intuitively based on my own experience, I understood how to listen to people that are in that state. And then from my training, um, that really being, being trained to be an art therapist specifically opened me up to the incredible richness 
of creative modalities for healing, which again, I think we all intuitively understand. We all flock to live music because we get this experience of communion and emotional connection and feeling felt, feeling seen and, you know, dance thing and painting. But what I learned in this program is sort of the, the reasons that these things are so healing and so profound. Um, and so having that lens of using creative tools, being with the person as they show up um, and sharing a little bit of my personal experience, because for me, I got the master's in art therapy. I was an art therapist and then I crashed and burned. So there was a missing piece still. It wasn't like, oh, cool, I'm solved as I thought I was. Um, it's much more, what I learned is it's much more about taking risks on yourself against all of the fears in your head, like buying into that tiny, tiny part of you that says, maybe this could work. Maybe I could improve my circumstances. Maybe I'm not going to be happy tomorrow. Maybe I'm not going to be happy in a month. Maybe I'm never going to feel totally contented. But if I can just make it through the next minute, make it through the next hour, make it through the next day, make these little micro shifts in my situation, things could get better. And, you know, there have been moments in my life, years of my life where I didn't believe that at all, but I also didn't kill myself. I kept going for some reason, even though I never believed that I would be one of those people who turned the corner. Um, and that's turn, not, yeah. Turn the corner to do what? To actually follow through on suicide or turn the corner and get out of depression? Which did you not think you would ever be? I never thought I would be someone who was glad to be alive. Yeah. I thought, okay, I'm either going to kill myself or be faking it. I, I really had this 50, 50, I'll make it to 30 idea in my head. I totally believed that I still do looking back. I mean, that was my reality. And now I'm 31. I'm here. I'm thriving. I still get depressed. Sometimes I still deal with hopelessness. Um, but I trust fundamentally that it will pass um, because I've gotten through it before. So what are the things that have been most effective or influential in you turning that corner, getting to the point where you now understand that these depressive thoughts will pass and there is the potential for you to be a happy person? Yeah. So as I said about my travel from New York to Los Angeles, so much of my hope came back in just making that decision and setting off. Um, like even in those last few months of being in New York where I was just absolutely bottomed out miserable, I had this hope of, well, I'm planning to move to LA. Like I've got something in, on the horizon that I'm excited about. And when I talk to uh, you know, my clients or when I think about myself, when I'm in these depressed states, a lot of times we feel like I don't have anything to look forward to. There's nothing in my future that feels worth waiting around for, whether you think you're going to kill yourself or not, whether your suicidal ideation is, is active or passive, it's really important for your overall well-being to feel like there's a hopeful thing that's going to happen in the future. It doesn't have to be enormous. It could be, I'm going to go for a walk. It can be, I've got a concert at the end of the month, you know, um, it doesn't have to be monumental, um, but having something that just kind of keeps you going through those tough moments, even if even if you feel I'm in a complete black tunnel. Um, so that's at the most basic level. But stretching beyond that, some of the really most instrumental things that have caused other giant shifts for me um, in, in doing this work and working with other people that has always provided me a tremendous amount of value, like connecting with other people, um, seeing my journey reflected in them and seeing my usefulness to them, having a purpose, having a purpose is fundamental to getting out of depression. Um, we all need to feel that. And I think that modern society kind of really dilutes a lot of 
the average person's sense of purpose. Um, we, we don't necessarily feel like we belong. We don't necessarily feel like we have a critical role in making the world a better place. Um, but I've been so fortunate to get to go into spaces and feel valued and feel like an expert at what I do and, and see my impact on people. Again, it's, it's that sense of being seen. Yeah. I could name, I could name so many other things like tangible to intangible that, that have helped me. Um, but I'm, I'm curious if you want me to go somewhere else. So did you, uh, just stumble into your purpose or did you have a tool that helped you define your purpose? Yeah. Um, sometimes it really does feel like I'm falling behind backwards into things. Um, you know, you, you have a random spark or connection with someone or, you know, you, it's almost, it kind of feels like what we see on TV or in the movies where a character just kind of sees something and they don't really know why, but there's a sparkly little light around it. And they just kind of, it becomes their function to move towards that. I would liken it to that, you know, like when I was living in New York, I had all these friends who had just moved to LA and there was just something in me that was like, LA, 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 you know, (laughs) this little sparkly, maybe, maybe I could be happy there. Like little whispers, little intuitive whispers. Um, And people, people say, which kind of makes me laugh. People say that, oh, like you were so brave to move across the country. And I'm like, I had no choice. Like I was totally miserable. I had nothing to do other than follow these intuitive whispers and just cross my fingers. Well, and of course, what they're saying in that is if they had done that, they would have had to overcome a tremendous amount of fear. So it would have been very brave for them to do it. Yeah. But for you, it felt like you didn't have any choice. This is all you have. You have to pursue that because the other option is waiting at the top of the building. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I think that sometimes, sometimes my anxiety and my fear space prevents me from doing things. And that's very real for me too. But a lot of times for me, my motivation is, well, the other side of this is numbness, all consuming grief. Like, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a pit that I'm very familiar with. Um, and so my, my function or by necessity has been just, how do I move away from that space? How do I move towards light, um, and away from darkness? Although sometimes still, like I said, you know, it's not perfect. I wouldn't want anyone listening to this to think, wow, a hundred percent of the time Morgan feels amazing. That is not the case. Um, and that would be a harmful representation. And so if you would talk a little bit yeah. about when that happens and the less than joyful moments arise, what are some of your go-to behaviors, tools, tips that work for Morgan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have very fresh experience to tell you about. <laughs> so I, um, I am now moving into being a musician as well as a coach because Huzzah, I've been coaching other people to overcome their fears and go for the things that they're really passionate about. And music has always been that for me, buried it for, you know, decades. And now I'm back to it. Um, But because it's something that's so intensely uh, deep for me, it brings up a lot of fear. It brings up a lot of overwhelm and a lot of oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I actually can't do this. You know, it it takes me to that very sensitive place. So uh, it also, it it brings back all those um, feelings of uh, sort of black and whiteness. I really regress back to that, um, like I said, sensitive Old habit of thought, yeah. The old habit of thought, exactly. Um. And so there was a week or so where I was really struggling to put together the pieces. I, a couple months ago, I fired my manager. So I've been doing literally every single thing and trying to make the art and advocate for the art. And I had a fight with my partner. So it was like, all these things converged and my system was basically like, Nope, this is too much. And I tip, you know, I sort of tip back over temporarily Um, And I think the biggest thing, the biggest 
behavior or thing that is important for me to tell myself and remember in those moments is I've been here before. I know what this is. This isn't random. This isn't me returning to, oh, this is how I always am. Because, you know, having spent a lot of my life being in that place, it's really easy in those moments for me to feel like, oh, here I am back to this place where I belong. I belong depressed. Like we, I reattach to that label and I lose my sense of time. Um, I really feel like it's permanent again. So I have to work really hard to remind myself that it's not, um, to remember that there is positive stuff in my future, like I said before, but also not to beat myself, try to beat myself out of it. Like, with the weather analogy. I love that one because it's like, you know, you don't stand out in the middle of the downpour cursing the rain. You go inside, you, you, you lift up an umbrella, you wear boots. Um, and so in this case, you know, I would sit on the couch, pull up a blanket and get cozy, make myself feel warm, make myself feel physically nurtured and watch TV pass the time. Um, when I felt up for it, I went for a walk. You know, I know the importance of moving my body. I know the importance of asking myself the most basic questions like, have I eaten? Am I thirsty? Am I tired? And being tired is a huge part of it. Like a lot of people, when they're depressed, they just want to be in their bed. And I think there's, yes, there's a, a component of that that's like, I want to avoid life. I want to have, I want to sort of be dead. But on the other hand, I think a lot of us just need rest, need a lot more rest than we're getting. And our lives are so stressful. Um, and we forget to take ourselves out of that from time to time and just kind of let our nervous systems recover. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's still that same thing of how can I meet myself where I am asking yourself that question and really listening. I think that's the biggest thing that I haven't actually, um, explained more that's a big tool for me is developing a dialogue with myself and being able to identify oh okay this voice telling me that i'm garbage that's that voice that always tells me that i'm garbage i know that's there i expect that to be there i don't have to believe it just because it's in my head i have this other voice when i close my eyes and i breathe deeply that says you're gonna be okay let's eat something maybe you want to talk to someone. And what I learned from taking big and small risks on myself is that those are the moments where you need to take those little leaps of faith. Maybe I'll call someone. Maybe I won't be the biggest burden in the world to them because that's, you know, another sort of mental distortion that depression does. It wants us to isolate. And that is the most harmful thing we can do <laughs> to getting ourselves out is we really need to connect. We need to be seen. Um, and so if you don't have someone that you can connect to or you don't feel comfortable connecting with someone who, you know, is in your phone book, call a, a line, call a warm line, call a hotline. Um, just hearing another voice and hearing that they're hearing you shifts something in you that might make that self-belief a little more accessible. Get you to the point where you can actually believe it. The other part of your mind that's saying this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's hard because for a lot of people, you know, the depressive episodes aren't just 24 hours. Sometimes they're weeks, sometimes they're months. And to do that, wake up every day feeling like you have to move a mountain is exhausting and can feel impossible. But yeah, you, you have to sort of treat it the same, like the weather analogy, like I'm waking up in, in this rain, it's still raining. Okay, how can I meet myself where I'm at today and not force myself to, to feel like I'm, I'm not okay as I am. Right, and not go back into the judging. Right. Judging, right. you know, most of us understand that, who work in the field understand that if I'm going to be really harsh and judgmental of others, I will also be turning that on myself. Right. And that is about as con contraproductive as um, when I turn it on myself as it is when I turn it on somebody else. Yeah. I love the um, Sylvia Borstein 
who talks about how whenever she gets upset, has a negative emotion going, she puts her hand over her heart space and she says, Sylvia, sweetheart, you're in pain. Take a few deep breaths. Then we'll calm down. Then we'll look at what's going on. And then we'll decide what to do. But for now, Timmy, sweetheart, you're in pain. Mm -hmm. And that being gentle with myself is the opposite of what my depressed voice would tell me to do. Yeah. And so, you know, building the habit of being gentle with myself, even when I'm in a relatively good space is really an important thing. I know one person I work with has um, cats instead of uh, children. Mm -hmm. Um, They're cheaper. (laughs) <laughs> no college you have to pay for she just and she loves her cats and she's constantly talking to them gently and lovingly and at one point when we were doing our work together and i suggested that she you know be gentle with herself she came back the next session and said you know what it, it seemed weird when i thought about it but i decided to start talking to myself just the way i talked to my cats and she said it didn't seem weird so i've been doing it <laughs> and it works So whatever works to get me to be more gentle with myself and to build that as a habit, then it kind of, uh, it builds a buffer for me against those times where the depressed thoughts come in or the high anxiety comes in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And I think that that's another reason that it's important to try to seek out others when you're, when you're being depressed, because it's such a tangible reminder that you wouldn't talk to someone else the way that you talk to yourself. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, one thing that I, I really like to try to explain to my clients is, you know, the way that when you, you get the, this, this anger kind of and criticism like lodged into you, uh, usually at a young age, usually by a parent figure, someone who you really want and you need love from you need the goods to survive from if they get angry at you and don't let you express yourself towards them or let you have negative an appropriate negative reaction you're always turning it inward on yourself because that's the only thing you can control like depression a lot of people say depression is anger turned inward and you have to recognize that you're intense self-hatred in those moments is kind of like that thorn lodged deep inside of you that's saying, I can control this. I can make this better by causing pain to myself. I can help some caregiver, imagined past caregiver to be right. If I criticize myself, if I tell myself I'm a piece of garbage and can't do anything, then they're right. And in some backwards way, it's like that protects me but you have to recognize that as an old program that you have to overthrow in order to get to that next level of not just barely surviving, but thriving yourself and acting not out of a fear of disappointing others, but acting from a place of, I want better for myself. And to do that, most of us have to identify and then remove the negative beliefs that say, I don't deserve better. Yes. So it's that kind of a two prong approach of, you know, building the habit of thinking positively and gently toward myself and being uh, willing and honest when I run into the old negative thoughts that are born from a belief that says I don't deserve better. And being, you know, if if I'm equipped with some tools for accessing and then dismantling those negative beliefs, then I can really make progress. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, you do that, you chip away at it and you have to have a tremendous amount of patience for how long it takes. Um, I have to remind people all the time, like these, these patterns have been built for decades and you're not going to overthrow them in a week. I have one client who we literally literally joke about like, so I'm going to be done with this in a week. Right. (laughs) Um, and we laugh about that because that's that that's that unless totally you had distorted. a yeah, but unless yeah. you had a really bad childhood and it might take a month <laughs> exactly. with a really good coach, with a really good coach. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If you pay them enough, you're going to heal faster. Right. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. So it takes time and you have to celebrate the little wins that you get along the way. You, someone, it helps sometimes to have someone else reminding you, wow, a month ago, you might not be healed, but a month ago, you didn't even believe this was possible or you would have never opened up to that person in your life and let them into your truth and, and gained that connection. Um, because those things that, that may seem small when you compare them to, well, I want to be instantly happy, but they're enormous. They're enormous to getting you on that path. And having someone like you as a coach to help point out the mile markers and the progress is indispensable. A hundred percent. And, you know, I, I think that I, I really like to advocate in my work for you have all the tools you need. I make sure my clients know that they have everything that they need to make this happen for themselves. Like it's within them. They can connect to their internal guidance and get answers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, it's like, it's like Dorothy. She had the power all along to get home. She had to click her heels and say a thing. Um, but the power of, of learning how to do it in a relationship is sort of like what I said before. You have to know that someone sees you. You have to get that initial nudge of, oh, maybe if this other person believes in me, maybe I can believe in myself. Maybe I can click my heels. Um, the container of a relationship, like in therapy, with coaching, whatever, is gives you that sense of being seen and gives you that sort of bedrock on which it's easier to overcome the fears about connecting with yourself. It's easier to buy into that positive version of yourself because someone else is telling you, I see it. I see it. Yeah. When people can help hold up the mirror for you, when you can't hold it up for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So if you figure it, we're, we're running low on time here and mm -hmm. we want to review and say, okay, so what's an aspect of the work that you do or your story or a success story with one of your clients that you want to share before we uh, wrap up? Sure. Oh my gosh. Um, so many things I could say. Um, let's see. I'll tell a story about um, a client that I met with yesterday. Um, and she's a, a young woman about my age who also suffers with depression. Um, and she is such a funny, such a bright and fun like and self-deprecating young woman um, from the Midwest. And she lives out here in Los Angeles and she is a music teacher. She teaches young kids and gets them excited about music, gets them to collaborate, gets them to try new things. And she is just such a shining advocate for them. And, and I'm just always you know, in awe of my clients. I always think that they're just amazing. And so I love getting the opportunity to hold up that mirror to them. Um, and we went through an exercise yesterday. She was having some, some real challenge seeing that hope that I was talking about, like really seeing herself as worthy. She said to me, I already feel like I'm a lost cause. And that makes it really hard to take those little risks on yourself. Um, and I asked her, well, where, where don't you feel like a lost cause? You know, where do you feel like you have something to offer? Where do you trust yourself? We were talking about, she doesn't, she doesn't trust herself to, to move forward. And she described to me what happens when she goes to school and teaches her kids. And, you know, she, she works with them to, overcome their fears about trying a different instrument or something like that. And she's like, you know, I stand at the front of the room and I say things with total confidence. I believe every single thing I say, I know that I'm helping these kids and I know exactly what I'm doing. And so getting someone to see this version of themselves, to, to reconnect with the version of themselves where they feel that confidence, that trust, that security, that sense of value and purpose, all these things that I was talking about before, then you unlock their internal access to that version of themselves. And it's like now they're wearing their own, what would Jesus do bracelet where they can go, what would this empowered version of myself do? And so I got her to really picture clearly 
that version of herself. If she was at the front of the classroom, um, teaching kids in her dream world, when she was the most confident, what would she be wearing? And she was like a pink ball gown. Great. Tell me more about that pink ball gown. Okay. It has polka dots. And I'd probably also be wearing long gloves and I'd have a little headband and maybe I'd be wearing pearls. And it's really important that she gets a really clear image of who that highest version of herself is because the clearer it is, the more touch point she has for being able to access it when she doesn't believe it, the more real that version is. I even kind of made a joke with her of saying like, I can see you at the top of the class with fully decked out in your ball gown, talking to a, a, a room full of students that are just little versions of you going like, okay, teacher, tell me, you know, tell me what I should do. Oh my God. And, you know, we both laughed about that because it's very silly. I was imagining like an adult head on all these children's bodies, but bringing it into laughter, bringing it into a clear visual makes it stickier, makes it easier for her to access in the future. So she can go in any given moment of her life. How can I make a decision that aligns with that best version of myself? And a corollary to that is that when anything negative or less than that comes up, it's just another picture image. It's just mm -hmm. another version of myself from an earlier time where I didn't have all the resources. And the, the, what you're doing with that kind of visualization and having her tap into her actual core strength that she feels in certain situations is opening the door to this discovery process about other parts of her that might be younger or wounded and need reassurance. And they're oh, yeah. just as accessible. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love, I love doing visualizations with clients and guided meditation. It has such a benefit of relaxing you on a physiological level, which takes you a little further away from being in that fear space, that fight or flight space. And then you just have more room to talk to your deeper wisdom and you have more tools to, um, you know, kind of hack. We, I did another visualization with the same client and she showed up as a small version of herself that traveled all the way down her body into her stomach. And her stomach was full of these black, it was like a jungle of these black thorny vines. And initially she felt totally incapacitated and hopeless. And she curled up into a, she imagined her little self curling up into a ball. And then through talking to her, we uncovered maybe there's this superhero version of her that comes down and they have a machete and they're hacking through and making the problem just smaller. Um, it, it's really fun. It's really fun to get into someone's creative creativity, really. So how do people get a hold of you? Yeah, um, it's easy. Uh, you can go to my website at morganbeard.coach, M-O-R-G-A-N-B-E-A-R-D, like a beard on your face, dot coach. Um, and there's lots of links that are like, Hey, get in touch with me. <laughs> um, and you, you know, you can find my socials there, um, and fill out a little form and let me know what you're interested in and, and why you want to get in touch with me. I'm, I hope that it translated through me talking to you, but I'm extremely accessible. I'm extremely, you know, warm and understanding and open and, um, you know, anyone who wants to work with me and has interest in what I do or, sees me as maybe an access point to that little hope, that little version of themselves that maybe this could exist. Maybe I could buy into this. Maybe she could help me like go for it. I will nurture the bejesus out of that little self and together we'll figure it out. So if you get that inkling, absolutely. Or if you get that inkling from anything in your life, move towards it. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today and being part of the, the podcast here and journey's dream is all about empowering people to do what you're doing, what you're finding a way to carve out a healthier life, a healthier path through the mental health challenges that truth be told, all of us face at one point or another. So thank you so much for all that you do and for being willing to share with us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Morgan Beard has dedicated her life to using creativity to heal and empower. Managing depression and anxiety since age 13 made her 
personal development something that was non-negotiable. After getting her master's in art therapy, her life came to a screeching halt as she burned out doing what she thought was her life purpose, and yet entered another depressive episode. Focused for the first time ever on her own happiness, Morgan started over in Los Angeles, California and began building her life coaching business. She was focused on helping others to restore belief in themselves, rewrite old programs that were keeping them stuck, and build lives full of fun and meaning. This gave her the confidence to embrace her passion for singing and to make music to help people move. She is currently working on her debut pop EP to be released in 2022. She can be reached via her website, morganbeard.coach, M-O-R-G-A-N-B-E-A-R-D dot C-O-A-C-H. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.